Hello. We're going to do the reading of the Bible study from July 24th, 2017. And the title is called The Responsibility of Being in Jesus. Colossians 2, 6 through 10 starts it. As you have therefore received Christ, even Jesus, the Lord, so walk, regulate your lives and conduct yourselves in union and conformity in him. It's interesting, lately at Hershey Farm, the author states he's been experiencing a lot of busyness. And he says, I have found myself being subjected to stress and the peace of my life has not been consistent. That being said, I know that Father has me where he wants me to be. Father has placed me where I have the opportunity to be in contact with a lot of people. I am in contact with a lot of people who have not learned who they are in Christ Jesus. When I feel pressure, when I feel stress, I immediately know that I'm not living out the truth of my life. So what is the truth of my life? I have received Jesus, I am in Christ Jesus, and I have been made one with Christ Jesus. When I feel stress and pressure, I realize that I am being deceived to conduct aspects of my life through my own strength and ability. It's impossible for me to walk out the assignment the Father has given me without the full revelation of who I am in Christ Jesus and without the complete adaptation to the revelation. You see, I have been empowered through my union with Jesus. If I stray away from that union, I become ineffective. In John 15, 5, Jesus says that whoever lives in him will bear much fruit. However, apart from my union with Jesus, I can do nothing. I am definitely doing something, but aside my, from my union with Jesus, that something is absolutely nothing. You see, when I get my eyes off of Jesus, I do not regulate my life and conduct my life in the effectiveness of being in union and conformed to Jesus and how he walked on the earth. I'm blessed with amazing potential, but that potential only becomes effective when I conduct myself in the full revelation and the full adaptation of my union and conformity to him. You see, Jesus overcame the world for me. Jesus took on flesh, but did not walk in the flesh. Jesus modeled life for us to reveal to us how to take on flesh, but put everything else aside to effectively walk in the spirit. When I walk in the spirit, I do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And when I walk in the spirit, I overcome the ineffectiveness of the flesh. It's the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. In verse 7, it says, Has the roots of your being, firmly and deeply planted in him, fixed and founded in him, being continually built up in him, becoming increasingly more conformed and established in the faith, just as you were taught in abounding and overflowing it with thanksgiving. Now, Jesus overcame the world for me, and Jesus reveals to me how to walk in the victory that he provides for me. Being in the world, there is a tendency to become rooted into things. The problem is, when we are in this world, but we can't be of this world, anything that we become rooted in has to be firmly and deeply planted in Jesus, in his teachings, and the truth. The only way to walk out who we are in Christ Jesus is to be firmly, so firmly in him, that he becomes our one and only foundation. Even everything that I do manifests from the revelation that I am Christ Jesus and he is my foundation. Everything must manifest in that. But what I am called to do is impossible through my own human strength. So I must realize that the enemy is always going to attempt to deceive me, to operate independently of me, of my complete dependency on Jesus. But I must be continually built up in Jesus. I must be continually confirmed and establish my faith with my confidence and trust in him. I can't be deceived to exalt the natural and the perception of my five physical senses. I must be prepared to believe way past what I'm able to see in the natural. What I want you to see from this verse is a necessity to be abounding and overflowing with thanksgiving. We are in a war and things aren't always going to be pleasant. However, because we are in Christ Jesus, we are positioned for victory. Outside of Christ Jesus, we are a train wreck going somewhere to happen. Now, breakthrough is accomplished through perseverance. Breakthrough is holding on and exalting our relationship with Father despite all the circumstances that we face. As we develop a history with Father, we develop the confidence of his goodness. We develop confidence in our position of being one with Christ Jesus. The enemy constantly works to attempt to cause us to exalt circumstances over truth, over our access to the provisions of the kingdom of God. When Jesus is your foundation, your life is built upon truth because Jesus came to bear witness of the truth. 
We need an intimate and accurate relationship with Father so that we become transformed by his nature so that his nature is seen through our lives. If we say we are in Christ Jesus, then we are responsible for that position. And verse 8, it continues, See to it, no one carries you off as spoil or makes you yourselves captive by his so-called philosophy and intellectualism and vain deceit, which is idle fancies and plain nonsense. Following human tradition, men's ideas of material rather than the spiritual world, just crude notions, following the rudimentary and elementary teaching of the universe, and disregarding the teachings of Christ, the Messiah. This is so huge. This is how the enemy works. The enemy works through deception to cause people to be deceived by people that are deceived. People are taken captive by human tradition, by human philosophy and intellectualism. The word captive is so appropriate. People become captive to a lie and become completely ineffective. The work of the enemy is to cause well-meaning people to be taken captive by deception. People are driven to focus on the material rather than the spiritual, walking in the flesh instead of walking in the spirit. Jesus came to reveal truth, to make people effective and free, and everything that is reduced down to human logic and human reasoning will take a person captive, completely ineffective, because the lie that they live has now become their truth. Now look at how Paul taught this revelation in the book of Corinthians. As for myself, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony and evidence or mystery and secret of God concerning what he has done through Christ for the salvation of men in lofty words of eloquence or human philosophy and wisdom. For I resolved to know nothing, to be acquainted with nothing, to make display of the knowledge of nothing, and to be conscious of nothing among you except Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and him crucified. And I was in, that's passed into a state of weakness and fear, which is dread, and great trembling after I had come among you. And my language and my message were not set forth and persuasive, which is enticing and plausible words of wisdom, but they were in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power, a proof by the Spirit and power of God operating on me and stirring in the minds of my hearers the most holy emotions and thus persuading them. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, which is human philosophy, but in the power of God. You see, this is amazing. Paul was actually one of the most educated men of his time. And despite that, Paul received the revelation of Jesus Christ so completely that he says that he determined to know nothing except Jesus. Paul knew that our faith could not rest in the wisdom of men, even though he was wise, but must completely be in the power of God. And yet today, so many people base their entire belief on God, of God, on the wisdom of men. Verse 9 continued, For in him the whole fullness and deity, the Godhead, continues to dwell in bodily form, giving complete expression of his divine creation. And you, you, are in him and made full, and having come to fullness of the life in Christ, you too are filled with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and reach full spiritual stature. And he is the head of all rule and authority, of every angelic principality and power. I don't know what most people do with these two verses, and I don't know... And I'm really not sure if they don't believe what they say. They may give mental assent to them, but they don't receive them as the truth of their life. Do you want the truth? Well, the truth is that Jesus is the fullness of deity, and we are blessed with the ability and privilege to be in Christ Jesus. There is nothing that Jesus had access to that we do not have access to. If you receive that revelation, it has to completely transform your life. There is nothing that you cannot accomplish there's nothing that cannot defeat you if you remain in Christ Jesus and operate from the truth, receive from Holy Spirit, and you fully take your place as a son or daughter of Father. What more could you possibly need to become effective? You see, everything that you need is provided for you except the determination to die to anything in the world that opposes the truth. We need the intimate, accurate relationship with Father that is offered to us so that we are transformed by his nature, so that his nature is seen through our lives daily. If we say we are in Christ Jesus, then we are responsible to live a life that confirms that we live in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus is continual promotion. Promotion is not just moving up. True promotion is moving forward 
It's positive motion. In all simplicity, it has to be for, or promotion, the impact of your relationship with Christ, Jesus promotes you. He constantly propels you to move forward, to take new territory, to walk out more and more revelation. An encounter with Jesus positions you to see Jesus is truth. When we encounter Jesus, we encounter truth. We are no longer slaves to a lie. And when you receive Jesus, when you live in Christ Jesus, you are now responsible to correctly reveal Jesus to the world. In Corinthians, the word says that we are Christ's own personal representatives. The enemy works through deception, and through that deception, the enemy attempts to deceive us of who we are, deceive us of the truth of this life. We must be aware of the tactics of the enemy. For some reason, the deception to criticize one another runs rampant through believers. Let's think about that. Once again, we have to know the truth of our life. We have to know who we are in Christ Jesus. We are not called to criticize people. Those people that we are deceived to criticize are merely victims of demonic circumstances. We are actually called to change their circumstances to offer them freedom. When we criticize people, we confirm their bondage. We curse their lives. How can that be? When we are called to offer freedom, we are filled with the Spirit of the Lord. In the Spirit of the Lord, there's liberty. So we are carriers of liberty. Criticize, criticizing people and criticism identifies and confirms a problem. Holy Spirit is in us to present an offer of freedom. We identify the problem, and then we should bring liberty on the scene. Everyone is so busy. Busyness is not just a fluke thing. It is a strategic attack of the enemy. We become busy because we become involved in things that the Holy Spirit never told us to be involved with, and we take on the responsibilities that the Holy Spirit never told us to be responsible for. When you take on the cares of the world, you tend to be critical. Criticism is a complete waste of time. When you walk in the revelation that you are in Christ Jesus, criticism is completely non-productive. We are not here to simply identify problems. We are here to offer truth and freedom. Too often we complain instead of impart. We have been filled with Holy Spirit so that truth can be revealed through our lives. We have nothing to complain about because we are blessed with power and authority to change circumstances. The definition of complaining is the expression of dissatisfaction or annoyance about a state of affairs or an event. It's the expression of a state that one is suffering from. Criticism is the expression of disapproval of someone or something based on perceived faults and mistakes. Now, so often people do not press into honor Father to live in Christ Jesus, so their lives are full of these obstacles and failures. Instead of taking responsibility and changing that, they find it much easier just to complain. God used Moses to bring the children of Israel out of captivity into Egypt and into freedom. Okay, God parted the Red Sea, did amazing miracles. However, the children of Israel still remained stiff-necked and did not fully trust Father. So we're going to take a look at this account. We're going to take a look at it in Numbers 13, 30, and 14 to 24. Now, this is a long section, and I suggest that you read it over a few times with other people in small groups, and then this will come to a revelation to you. Let's start with num Numbers 13, 30. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him and said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we are going as spies is a land that devours in its inhabitants and its people, whom we saw in it are men of great stature. They were giants, the descendants of Anak and the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. So we were in their sight." So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if we only had died in the wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly and the congregation of the children of Israel. 
But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we passed through, thought to spy out, is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said, Stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? How long will they not believe me with all the signs that I have performed among them? I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make you a nation greater than mightier than they. And Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear it, for by your might you brought these people up and among them, and you will tell it to their inhabitants of the land, that they have heard that you, Lord, are among these people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands above them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now if you kill these people as one man, then the nations will have heard of your fame and speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to give them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering, now abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers or the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt, even until now. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly, as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of God, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore, swore to them as their fathers, nor shall any of them who rejected me and rejected me see it at all, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him, and he has followed me fully. I will bring into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. Well, that's an amazing story. God did everything to provide for the children of Israel. They saw amazing miracles, had amazing provisions, had witnessed to the glory of God. However, despite all of that, they refused to trust Father. When people refuse to trust, they open this up for deception. And through deception, people definitely miss out on the blessing of the Lord. Now, let's take a quick look at Saul's encounter on the road to Damascus. Acts 9, 1-6. Meanwhile, Saul, still drawing his breath hard from threatening and murderous desire against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. Now, see, it was obvious that Saul was under demonic oppression. And requested of him letters to the synagogues at Damascus, authorizing him so that if he found any men or women belonging to the way of life, but as determined by faith in Jesus Christ, that he might bring them bound with chains to Jerusalem. Now, as he traveled on, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground. And he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Look how Jesus responded to Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Jesus took the actions of Saul very personally. And Saul said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is dangerous that you will turn out badly for you if you keep kicking against the goad to offer vain and perilous resistance. This is what I wanted you to see. In some translations, it says it's hard for you, Saul, to kick against the pricks. Now, a goad is a spiked stick used for driving cattle. In the days referred to here, it was a stick with a sharp metal point used to prod or direct the oxen. The more the oxen kicked in rebellion, the deeper the gold would pierce into their flesh. You may have heard the word, let's goad him. Now Jesus is telling Saul, the more you fight and rebel, the worse it will be for you. In verse 6, it continued, trembling astonished, he asked the Lord, what do you desire me to do? The Lord said to him, but arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. 
Now, two things I want you to grasp here. First, Saul was determined to destroy the Christians. But one encounter with Jesus completely transformed him. The other thing, just as Saul was in deception, a lot of people who think they were doing good or doing the right thing are actually bound up in deception. You probably know several of them. The enemy drives them through deception. Through deception, they end up fighting Jesus. And that never works out good for anyone, does it? Well, the children of Israel were caught up in complaining and criticizing. For Saul, he was deceived by the enemy, and he did not receive the truth. So I am in Christ Jesus, and I have a responsibility to walk out the truth of my life to correctly reveal Jesus to the world. When I gripe, when I complain, when I criticize him, I am actually exalting the enemy. I'm declaring that what Jesus did for me was not enough. How absurd is that? We need to be completely honest with ourselves and take the responsibility for any ineffectiveness in our lives. We have access to everything we need to walk in victory, to walk into success, and walk effectively while we're on this earth. We have to take what we have access to and be responsible to be promoted. Promoted, remember, means to position to move forward. Now John 15, 7 through 11. If you live in me, abide virtually united to me, and my words remain in you and continue to live in your hearts, ask whatever you will and it shall be done for you. When you bear or produce much fruit, my Father is honored and glorified, and you show and prove yourselves to be true followers of mine. We live in Christ Jesus. We abide virtually united to him. Our lives bear much fruit. When we bear fruit, Father is honored and glorified. Through our union with Jesus, we are positioned for success. And this success means that we walk in, reveals Jesus to the lost. Verse 9 continues, I have loved you just as the Father has loved me. Abide in my love or continue in his love with me. If you keep my commandments, if you continue to obey my instructions, you will abide in my love and live on in it, just as I have obeyed my Father's commandments and live on in his love. I have told you these things, my joy and delight may be in you, and that your joy and gladness may be a full measure and complete and overflowing. We are called at work and in many jobs to be shift leaders. Now, in a work environment, certain people are designated to lead the shift. Shift leaders are people with experience and outstanding characteristics. Shift leaders teach others to be effective, to be their best, and to be held accountable. From my experience in the hospitality industry, the author explains one of the most important attributes for the manager is their ability to develop people. We are in Christ Jesus, and we must be responsible for the position we hold, just as a shift leader is. It's not about works to affirm, really, who I am. It's about affirming who I am by my works, by my character. Being in Christ Jesus, I am responsible for being effective. There is nothing I do not have access to. I need to be yielded, obedient, and available. Being in Christ Jesus, I walk out a life of obedient effectiveness. I have awesome employees. However, there are some employees who do not determine in their heart to walk out their best. They rebel against procedures and their work is often unacceptable. They may work for me, but they do not represent what I stand for. Now, there are many people who say they believe in Father and Jesus, but they do not live a life that correctly represents Father to the world. Are you one of them? We are called to be Christ's personal representatives. Christ means anointed one. I personally represent the anointing available as one being in Christ Jesus. Let go of everything that is insignificant to position yourself to grasp eternity. Too often I take on too much care and concern to worry about the things that I must learn to totally trust Father for. Father has never let me down, so why would that happen now? To be effective, I must consistently resist the cares of the world. Saul was exposed to Jesus, just exposed to him, and it instantly transformed him totally. Jesus rearranges what the enemy attempts to arrange. Now, when you study about God and you study God from a distance, when you know Father, you were taught through intimacy. When Jesus pulls you in and you become addicted to him, when you experience Jesus, you experience fullness that does not allow the world to creep in. So many people are so addicted to so much stuff in the world. However, people have a radical encounter when they are exposed to Jesus. And even for the first time, they can be truly satisfied and they are freed from the slavery and the bondage. You were created to be in union with Father. 
And when you don't know who you are, there is a void that needs to be filled. Only your relationship with Father can fill that void. A relationship with the world will only lead to destruction. God does not empower me to judge people. God empowers me to change circumstances to free people. Now, conviction falls on deaf ears when you refuse to take responsibility of your assignment. So in ending, we'll say Proverbs 26, 20. There is no wood, the fire goes out. And when there is no talebearer, strife ceases. Now, the enemy deceives people to live, to acknowledge instead of walking out abundant life to reveal. The call on my life, the call on our life is to reveal, not to merely acknowledge. Jesus died for me so I could respond correctly to any injustice.